Asia. Now is the time when Asian society can take its place、uh, in this new world. Two thirds of the world's population. I think we get Asia, and we have done it long before anybody thought it was important. Rising tensions. The Asia Society knows more about Asia than any other organization. Fastest rising economy, soon to be the wealthiest region in the world. It's very nice to come back to the Asia Society because this feels very much like home. For 60 years, Asia Society is way ahead of its time. It's great to be back at the Asia Society. It's a great organization, and it's a real privilege to be here. One organization. It's wonderful to be back here at the Asia Society, doing what I think is very important work: building bridges. For many years, the Asia Society has served as a veritable bridge. No one else saw the potential. One organization did, ahead of its time. This is not a fly-by-night thing. This is an organization with 60 years of history. Six decades ago, few people in the West understood the potential and the importance of Asia. To many Americans, Asia was synonymous with poverty and with war. I'm Tom Brokaw. I'm an emeritus trustee of this remarkable organization called the Asia Society. An organization that always has been ahead of its time, whose leaders have always understood that potential and understood the value of building bridges between the U.S. and Asia. If you're doing Asia, if you're doing Asia work, you have to be a member of Asia Society. So I was, and it's considered in the world the place to go. I feel that when I address the Asia Society, I've arrived. The Asia Society has. Taught a lot of people what they wanted to know about Asia, and what they want to know is more and more every day. And we have done it with respect and a commitment to understanding that is not just selfish. So it is not simply to create an American view of what Asia is, but to really get Asia inside out. And that goes back to John D. Rockefeller III. John D. Rockefeller III, grandson of the famous family patriarch. Mr. Rockefeller, your brother Nelson was quoted、uh, as having said in an article, "I've never found it a problem to be a Rockefeller." Would you agree with your brother in this respect? Well, I would feel there were strong advantages and、uh, some. Situations where one was a little less comfortable than if one was just an ordinary citizen. One way Rockefeller took advantage: he traveled to Asia. First, as a young man with his parents, and after World War II, he visited Asia nearly every year. Those trips were the beginning of a lifelong passion and appreciation for the people of Asia and for Asian arts and culture. He filled long journals with notes about the people he met, ordinary people, and the way they lived, and the top power players in the region. He wrote about the need for a two-way street in the exchange of ideas between the U.S. and Asia, and he suggested the creation of what he called a Pan-Asian society. John D. Rockefeller III came back from his experiences in war-torn Asia. And gathered the best minds of the time to say, "How do we tend to this relationship? How do we deepen the ties between the U.S. and Asia? How do we ensure against the kind of tensions and war that has torn Asia apart and the world apart?" And that's where Asia Society was born. The Asia Society was born in New York on June 28, 1956. Its mission. To promote greater knowledge of Asia in the United States, I think the founding of it in the first place was an achievement that was remarkable. And then, what was even more bold was it was founded in 1956, right after the the McCarthy period, and where there was an enormous amount of suspicion. The decision, therefore, to move ahead with an Asia society it took political guts to do that. He felt that the future lay across the Pacific, and that if we understood each other and understood、uh, each other's customs and countries and 
families and institutions, that we would build a future together. It was totally visionary. John D. had some idea of where this was going to go. He understood the value of the region and he got us in on the ground floor. The Asia Society was born without a home of its own. It held programs where it could, until it opened offices in 1959 in a Manhattan building designed by the architect Philip Johnson. In those early years, the society hosted Asian leaders and Asian performers, Ravi Shankar, for his first appearance in the U.S. Rockefeller himself welcomed the King of Thailand, the King and Queen of Afghanistan, and other Asian dignitaries. The Society helped American teachers provide courses on Asia, and its first exhibition, called Masterpieces of Asian Art, drew raves, works of supreme genius, said one critic, with the power to stir the imagination. By the early 1970s, the Asia Society was producing more programs, its exhibitions larger in scale, and now routinely winning rave reviews. Then, the still young organization received a remarkable piece of news, courtesy of its founder. John D. Rockefeller III and his wife, Wanchette, were donating their magnificent collection of Asian art to the Asia Society, masterpieces from across the continent. My own experience, Rockefeller said that day, tells me that anyone who becomes acquainted with the arts and cultures of Asia acquires a greatly augmented sense of appreciation and respect for its peoples. We hope that the collection can help instill in Asian-American relations an added sense of importance and opportunity. The gift would present an opportunity and a challenge the Asia Society would need to double its gallery space. Ground was broken for a new home at 725 Park Avenue. But the Asia Society founder would not live to see the result. John D. Rockefeller III was killed in a car accident in 1978. He was 72 years old. The Society's president, Phillips Talbot, wrote of Rockefeller and his legacy, we can say that when he died, the society had completed its early days. A strong foundation had truly been laid for the society's ever-growing contribution to Asian and American life. By the late 1970s, Asia was changing in profound ways. War-torn nations morphing into economic powerhouses. The Asia that Rockefeller had visited growing unrecognizable. The Asian that he had foreseen becoming reality. In many ways, we were very lucky. The economic takeoff of Asia in the 1980s, that became a magnetic story for a lot of people. Nowhere were the changes as profound as in China. President Nixon's groundbreaking trip had opened a new chapter in U.S.-China relations. Future Asia Society President Nicholas Platt was a member of the Nixon delegation. He took these rarely seen films. These are some close-ups that I took during the visit uh, in Hangzhou, what Nixon looked like then, what Zhou and Lai looked like. The China breakthrough and the Asia Society itself made a splash on American television. In 1977, I hosted a special edition of the Today Show on the subject. To relations between the United States and China, we want to discuss that question and others this morning with a panel of experts that we have assembled here. Among my guests, the Asia Society President, Bob Oxnum. 
and reflect that it was five years ago today that uh, Shanghai Communique was signed, there was a kind of euphoric reaction in this country. When Nixon went to China, as many people were watching him land there as watched uh, Armstrong, Neil Armstrong, land on the moon. In the U.S., interest in Asia soared. The Asia Society education team helped introduce Asian studies in American schools and universities. Educating Americans about Asia was what we were supposed to do. And here was this huge field, the younger children, uh, uh, looking for, for information and for knowledge about Asia. And we didn't have a particular policy axe to grind. We just wanted to broaden their horizons and fill them up with, uh, with material. With much of Asia on a meteoric rise, the Asia Society, begun as a New York institution, began to grow its global footprint. New centers in the U.S. and also in Asia, Mumbai and Manila, Sydney and Seoul, Shanghai and Hong Kong. The Hong Kong Center opened as a small office in 1990. One of its early champions, Hong Kong businessman Ronnie Chan, dreamed of something more. The idea came about in an advisory council meeting. That idea would transform the Asia Society's Asian footprint a nearly 20-year odyssey, culminating in an architectural masterpiece. Once it opened, I said, oh, wow, we have something huge here. I'm very, very happy, very, very pleased. In that sense, I'm very proud of what the Hong Kong Center has done. This is not for me, although I enjoy it. This is for Hong Kong. This is for the Asia Society. And this is for better relationship between the two sides of the Pacific. And back in the U.S., another architectural masterpiece in Houston, Texas. Thank you for this great gift to our city. For the Asia Society, building bridges has meant all kinds of cultural exchanges, policy conferences, and meetings of global leaders. It has also meant deepening the conversation at times of strife. After the attacks on September 11th, the Society built bridges of understanding with programs about Afghanistan and Pakistan and about Islam. But building bridges also has meant working in the so-called back channels of global diplomacy. I would say that the idea of informal diplomatic channels and conversations have been happening at the Asia Society for a long, long time. It's happened in Williamsburg conferences we did in Asia. Then what happened was two areas. One was Iran and the other one was Myanmar. With Myanmar, or Burma, under the thumb of a repressive regime, isolated by global sanctions, and with pro-democracy leader Aung San Suu Kyi under house arrest, the Asia Society helped facilitate conversations inside the country aimed at supporting democratic reforms. In 2011, still unable to travel outside her country, Suu Kyi addressed an Asia Society gathering on videotape from her home. And I look forward to the time when I can come to New York, come to the Asia Society, and thank you personally for what you have done to support Burma and to support our movement for democracy. The breakthrough in Myanmar finally came after nearly a half century of repressive rule. That fall, when the new president of Myanmar and Aung San Suu Kyi traveled to the U.S., both made their first public appearances at the Asia Society. The Asia Society and uh, all who uh, represent the commitment that started in the 1950s. And it's 
a great pleasure to see many familiar old faces. Aung San Suu Kyi mentioned that she had known and been familiar with Asian society for many years and that she was very proud of what we had accomplished because we had kept the lines of communication open. We did not leave this conversation, we instead carried it on as an institution. And I think that's what John D. Rockefeller would have wished of our conversations. The Asia Society back channel produced other extraordinary moments. If the Myanmar diplomacy was long and complicated, the work on Iran was more so, beginning almost 20 years ago. I made sure that we kept our lines of communication open with with the Iranians. I guess it was in 98. Uh, the new Iranian president said he wanted to start a conversation between civilizations. I went down to the UN the next day and I said, hey, we, we, we volunteer. So Vishaka and Bob and I and my wife formed a delegation to go to Iran and start the conversation between civilizations cultural trips to Iran, exhibitions of Iranian art, music, performance, and diplomacy. We used culture, as far as Iran was concerned, culture was the thin end of the wedge that allowed us to get in close and talk to people, uh, because that was the one thing that was non-controversial about the relationship with Iran. The back channel work came into the open in 2013 when the U.S. and Iran announced their first high-level talks in four decades. And when Iran's newly elected president came to the U.S., one of his first stops was an Asia Society event, interviewed by the new Asia Society president, Josette Sheeran. We're very pleased that you decided to partake in the only public session uh, during your time here in a meeting with the public. I interviewed him and I was quite pleased that he was willing to take questions from Twitter, from the internet, and there were no restrictions on what we asked. We have a question from Facebook. At Asia Society, our mission is the more we dis may disagree or feel worried or offended by actions or situations in countries, the more we feel we must get in there and ask questions and try to ferret out an understanding of what's happening. I love the Asia Society. I go to the Asia Society regularly. I really want to congratulate the Asia Society on 60 years of building understanding between Japan, other nations in Asia. And now, it's more important than ever to ensure connections of mutual respect between Americans and Asians in education, the arts, public policy, and business. Today, six decades on, the Asia Society has taken that original Rockefeller mission and multiplied its impact, launching the Asia Society Policy Institute with Kevin Rudd, former Prime Minister of Australia, as its first president. The Asia Society Policy Institute has an ability to do two things, bring together uh, the enormous uh, civilizational traditions uh, of, uh, of Asia, and based on that knowledge, uh, adopt other wisdoms uh, to the resolution of contemporary challenges as well. The Arts and Museum Network, led by the Asian arts trailblazer, Tan Boon Hui. Culture is what makes us human. We have found ways of sustaining culture. We have found ways of achieving initiative that of, of tying together economic, social and cultural development and the Center for Global Education under longtime champion Tony Jackson. The world has changed tremendously, particularly in the last, say, two generations, and we really wanted to have an education that would equip students to be prepared to be not just followers, but leaders within a very different global climate. At every turn in every area, still building those bridges, the Center on U.S.-China Relations. The Center on U.S.-China Relations recognizes that at this moment in history, the world really does turn in many ways in the U.S.-China relationship. And that includes culture, environment, business, academic life, and the Center tries to cover all of these things. The Asia 21 Young Leaders Network, 
The Asia 21 program, I think, is extraordinary. It really is an extraordinary program, and my hat's off to you. And most recently, the Asia Game Changer Awards, the first such honors for people having transformative impact in Asia. We all have the responsibility to do more things to improve the society. I thank the Asia Society for this honor. In their own ways, all these people and all these programs are expanding that far-sighted vision of John D. Rockefeller III. Sixty years later, building ever more powerful bridges connecting the people of Asia with one another and with the people of the United States. My hope and dream for Asia Society would be that we take on this biggest challenge of our generation, which is to look at the rise of Asia and how we incorporate this into the world without war or conflict. And so that is our root, that's our DNA, and we feel more passionate about it than perhaps at any point in history and more relevant. And that is our future. And that's the goal we hold ourselves against. Hello, everybody. I'm Greg Wu coming at you from the Asia Society in New York City. Welcome to Asian America, the leading public television program focusing on Asia and Asian America and syndicated by PBS. He's known as the Pavarotti of Iran and <laughs> performed his, uh, in New York this past weekend with his son and other musicians. The Asia Society was kind enough to provide us with some of this footage from this event.